Greetings class, welcome to another session here of uh, TESOL Methods and Materials. We are taking most of uh, this information from uh, Brown's uh, textbook Teaching by Principles. There are going to be other things that I'll be adding today. Today we're going to be looking at some of the principles or uh, psychological components that are uh, part of teaching that we need to remember uh, when we're setting up our design and procedures and obviously when we're selecting um, when we're selecting our approach uh, philosophies. Uh, today we're going to be looking at cognitive principles, socio-affective principles, and uh, linguistic principles. We're also going to be looking at uh, some work by uh, Omaggio and, and uh, the, uh, the research on the number of hours that it takes to actually complete a specific level of language learning. Let's begin with some of the cognitive principles uh, that we as language learners uh, want to try to impress upon our learners. Uh, the first being here, automaticity. Um, this is actually a questionable, uh, according to people like Krashen, uh, the idea of automaticity is where we want to take something that's uh, learned and push it into more uh, longer term memory. Push it into things that you kind of do for, you know, you kind of take for granted when you do them. You don't actually think about them anymore. Say, for example, uh, driving a, a car. Uh, when you first begin to learn how to drive a car, your hands are at 10 and 12, and you're constantly thinking and looking, and you're analyzing your steering, and your, you know, the mirrors and the pedals, and the, you, you're basically overwhelmed by this new bit of information that you're trying to grapple with. Um, but eventually, you, you learn to drive in such a way that I'm certain that those of you who are experienced drivers have experienced the, the. Uh, the uh, type of thing where you're, you're driving somewhere and then you get to your destination and then all of a sudden you say, how did I get here? <laughs> how, did, how did I do that? Because you're used to driving. You know, it just have becomes second nature to you, much the way language becomes second nature to you. Uh, I, I recommend you, for example, begin to notice the way people speak and ask them after you notice something ask them why they say it a certain way and to be honest many of them will be shocked and or surprised uh, that they even say it that way because they don't notice it and to them it's just automatic we as language teachers want to take things that are at the forefront of your memory things that you're constantly thinking of and move it back make it an automatic uh, type of response that we don't even think about um, that's what automaticity is all about. Uh, second point here is to make sure that when we do give uh, uh, some type of materials for our students to learn, that whatever we're giving them is meaningful to them. Um, I, for one, am not very interested in uh, ice fishing on the uh, in Alaska. But I may have students who find that very interesting. And so I may create a materials that are attuned to what is meaningful to them. Um, I, for example, I have uh, uh, some uh, students that love uh, gaming. They love to play, you know, computer games and, you know, Xbox type of things. Me, I'm not very interested in those things. However, to keep them interested, to make it meaningful to them, I may be able to create materials that are focused on that. And so it's meaningful to them. Again, someone who's looking for a job, someone who's interested in writing a resume or getting accepted to a college or studying, you know, nanotechnology, whatever, it should be meaningful to the user, I, in other words, to the student, and not something that you find interesting or something that, you know, because you have these materials, therefore I'm going to be teaching with them. What you're giving your students should be meaningful to them, right? Anticipation reward. Anticipation reward is the idea that students are going to expect to get something out of, out of their uh, learning, so they should be excited about the learning. And if we recognize that they're going to be excited about getting something out of it, they're going to be more motivated to want to learn. Um, so they should be expecting some type of a reward. Now, the reward could be internal. It could be the actual language themselves. It could be something else. Um, I'm, I'm less concerned uh, about the next issue here, intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. I will recognize that intrinsic motivation is better. But I also believe that 
uh, giving rewards, okay, whether they are physical or points or something, can help encourage students to learn, which can lead to intrinsic motivation. Again, there's no guarantee, but I certainly have seen that in other venues in other areas of study. Uh, so because students are anticipating an award, uh, it's wise to use that to your advantage to continue encouraging them to study. Next point here, which we will talk a little bit more about in detail next uh, in our next session here, is uh, intrinsic motivation. Uh, two different types of motivation, ex intrinsic and extrinsic. Intrinsic is internal. I'm studying for studying's sake. I'm studying because I enjoy it. Uh, there are people who, uh, um, who teach other people how to fish, okay? Uh, but there are people who just teach fishing because they love to teach, or they do fishing because they just love fishing. Um, I, I have friends who love gardening. You know, me, it's a lot of work. It's not something that I would motivate, but they're internally motivated because they enjoy it so much. The same would be for language learners. There are some language learners who simply want to learn. It is their desire to learn. They're internally motivated. You're not going to have much of a problem with those. But we as teachers should fight, try to, to uh, create materials in such a way that we can try to develop intrinsic motivation. Um, next uh, point here is uh, in uh, strategic investment. Um, if there are ways that you can get your students involved and the word here invested in what they are learning, um, they are going to be much more motivated to want to learn uh, if they can claim some sort of ownership over what they're doing. Uh, that's going to be a plus for the students. And so there are things that we can do as language teachers to try to encourage people to uh, uh, have some sort of an investment in what it is that they're learning. Um, we want to show students that the amount of time that they put in, the effort that they put in, is going to give them something back. I find it very frustrating to be in a class as a student and realize that none of the materials that I'm learning or any of the things that I, is, is not going to help me at all. Uh, I'm just studying so that I can get out of the class or it's, it's not going to be useful to me or, or valuable to me. Uh, we as, as language teachers want to try to create or show uh, why it would be in good to invest time and energy and effort uh, into language learning. Uh, and if students can see that and recognize that, again, they're going to be more motivated. The last point here in their cognitive principles is autonomy. Uh, we've talked a little bit about this before. Autonomy is the concept whereby uh, we encourage students to do things for themselves. We want to create independent learners, and they don't need us. That's going to be my goal. I want to be able to show them how they can, for example, ask their own questions, try to get their own answers to problems, how to circumvent a problem, how to get a native speaker to help them, how to memorize, how to, uh, uh, how to practice something when, when you're not in a classroom. In other words, how to make uh, students uh, independent learners, okay? They're free to do learning without the need of a teacher or a classroom or a, and so that's what we, uh, that's what teachers want to be able to do as well. They want to, as I said before, push that student out, out of the nest to the point where they don't need you anymore and they can learn on their own uh, so that they will be able to develop their language skills. Those are some of the cognitive principles that uh, we as language teachers want to remember and want to try to take advantage of because these things do exist. Automaticity does exist. Meaningful learning can exist, right? Intrinsic motivation can exist. Strategic investment can exist. All of these things we want to remember and try to use them as we're designing classes and as we're uh, implementing procedures. In addition to the cognitive, there are also the socio-affective uh, principles. Uh, number seven here, language ego. Language ego is quite an interesting uh, dilemma um, that uh, language teachers need to, need to recognize. There are students 
who are afraid to learn another language, who are uh, resentful of learning another language, primarily because they have pride in their language. They have pride in their culture, and they don't want to give it up, which is quite interesting. It may also be that there is um, some animosity between the target culture and the native speaker's culture. And because there may be some animosity, there's some resentment and uh, in the willingness to communicate. So language ego, I'm very proud of my country and my language, and I don't want to learn another. Uh, or I, uh, it's too difficult, or there's too much of a stigmatism. I, I find it interesting, years ago I used to bring groups of students to, uh, to New York. Uh, and if I were to bring, for example, Japanese, a group of Japanese students to New York, when they were all together, they never spoke in Japanese, or almost never, because speaking, I'm sorry, they never spoke in English, my bad, because when these Japanese students came here, if someone started speaking in English, it would appear to some that they were being proud, that they were trying to show off, see how good I am. And because of this, no one spoke in English when they were here, when they were in a group. Uh, when they broke off into individual uh, little, you know, smaller group pairs or, you know, they went off with a native speaker, then they would be more willing to uh, to speak because there was none of this pressure, right? That language ego and willingness to communicate and willingness to communicate is, again, the, because of the pressures that we have from from our culture, from other cultures. And then, of course, just the emotional stability of someone who's interested or not interested in communicating. In the world of... So that's language ego, okay? With regard to willingness to communicate, there is the language impact. There is the cultural impact. But there's also just the individual. Um, uh, just take, for example, freshman composition in a typical college classroom or a typical high school uh, classroom. These are students who do not want to take freshman English. No one is really saying, oh yes, I want to study how to write or I want to learn how to do research. And people aren't interested in doing it for the most part. So we have an unwilling, uh, a disinterested audience in that case. Or you may have someone <clears throat> who's working in a, again, in an EFL environment, and these are students who are learning English, but they it's not gonna be useful to them. All of their neighbors, all of their friends, you know, they all speak, uh, they all speak Portuguese because they're from, uh, they're from Brazil. You know, what in the world do they wanna, to learn English from? But they have to, so they go to the, their willingness to communicate is going to go down, right? I need to recognize that, that pressure, right? and find ways to encourage them to want to communicate. Again, we'll go back to the carrot and the stick, but we're not going to talk about that now. These are some issues that we as teachers need to recognize. Is there a language ego issue? Is there a willingness to communicate issue? And how do we encourage students to want to communicate? Okay. Another uh, socio-affective principle that we can't avoid is a teaching culture. Um, it is undeniable that when a student or a person learns um, a language, they also learn another culture. And you cannot separate language from culture because they go hand in hand. Um, just, well, there are many ways that you can we can talk about the, the connection between the two. Um, but when we use language, uh, we are showing, we are displaying some cultural elements. Um, there are words that we have as well as gestures that we use, as well as facial expressions that we use to communicate, and those things have an impact on the culture. I'm sorry. Those things have an impact from the culture that they're coming from. So if I'm teaching someone who is uh, from, um, <clears throat> uh, let's just say from a German uh, background or from a British uh, background and their cultures are more reserved in in some regard than than American uh, cultures. Uh, I, I'm going to have I'm going to be teaching them things about the American culture because that's the way language is used. If I'm teaching someone from a for again from a Japanese uh, point of view from a Japanese culture, uh, words that we use, expressions that we say are going to also show some of the culture that we have. Uh, just for example, in a, in a Thai culture, they don't necessarily shake hands, but they, 
they put their hands together when they greet. And so the idea of hand uh, touching someone is going to be a little different. Uh, you know, a pat on the back type of thing is going to be different. That's also showing that we're more open. We use more open language and less formal language. Um, and so when we are teaching language, it behooves us to also teach culture. And there are going to be many opportunities when this happens. One example that I typically give uh, students are uh, some experiences that I had when I was teaching in Japan. I uh, would be teaching in the middle of a class, um, and I would have a students who would come in, and they were late. Um, so they're late for class. Something happened, and they were late for class. In a typical American classroom, if someone is late, especially at the college level, uh, they walk into the classroom as quiet as possible. They go to the back of the room. They might give a nonverbal sorry type of thing, and they sit down in the back of the room, and they don't say anything. Um, they don't interrupt what's going on. They do, at the end of class, go up and speak to the professor, apologize, provide some explanation, get information, but they don't disrupt the classroom. Now, in a typical Japanese scenario for high school or whatnot, the student comes directly to the teacher and apologizes. Now, uh, the first time this happened to me, I, I, was, I was like, what, what are you doing? Then I began to realize, well, that's their culture. So I used it to my advantage. Student would come in late. They would come up to me and they would say, oh, you know, and I would stop the whole class. Stop right what we're doing. This is a great opportunity to teach them some culture. And I would explain to them, you don't do that in a typical class. You go to the back. You don't disrupt the classroom. You wait until the end and then go up and speak to the teacher. It was a great opportunity to learn, uh, to show students that there are things that just simply aren't done. And there are different ways of doing things. Um, uh, so the culture connection exists, and we need to be remember uh, that we need to teach culture. Um, uh, another bit, teaching uh, gestures. I love learning about ways of uh, ways cultures teach gestures uh, because they again they they point to uh, their culture. Uh, the way people count, for example, some people count using their their first finger, right? One, two, three, four, five. It's the way I learned when I was growing up. Other cultures start with their thumb. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, and I know some uh, Spanish cultures that do it that way. I met a lady from Korea, the uh, not Korea, from Kenya the other day, and she counts from her thumb or her little pinky. One, two, three, four, five. And I was amazed. I'd never seen that before. Right? Uh, Japanese culture is going to start counting from their thumb. I'm sorry. They count with their hand open and they count backwards. One, two, three, four, five. Right? So they still count backwards. One, two, three, four, five. There are different ways of doing things. And so you'll be able to learn more, again, more about culture that way. How long you look at someone, when and how you touch someone. Um, <clears throat> How you speak to someone, how direct you are, how indirect you are, all culturally bound. So there is this connection. Other principles, the native language effect on second language acquisition. I am, uh, I'm, I'm interested to see where someone comes from, what their first language is, because generally it'll tell me how quickly they can learn the English language. Generally speaking, when someone's first language is closer to their uh, second language, they're going to be able to learn it faster. People whose first language is further away from their second language, as far as uh, uh, common common traits, common uh, common vocabulary, common uh, suffixes, common grammatical structure, uh, common sounds, right? The more common they are, the more um, benefit, the faster they're going to be able to learn language. Those that are further away, it's going to be more difficult. So that's another thing that you need to, to bear in mind. We'll talk a little bit more about this uh, in the next uh, couple of slides. Uh, another principle that we need to recognize is the interlanguage. This is uh, research out of by Selinker. He posited the idea that within the brain uh, of a language learner, there are a bunch of rules that are being dynamically uh, developed. Um, they're not always the same. So a student, and they don't realize this is happening. I mean, this is just things that are going on in their head while they're trying to in it, while they're trying to learn language. They have a, a rule in their head, and they establish this rule, and then they try to use language with that rule. 
and maybe someone think, looks at them like they don't understand, or maybe someone uh, says uh, to them, I don't understand, and then they notice, oh, I made a mistake. So they try to modify the rule in their head. Maybe they say something and someone says something back to them properly. You know, they say the same thing about, you know, uh, what did you, uh, what did you eat yesterday? You know, oh, what did I eat yesterday? Someone will reply back to them. And that person or their, you know, their subconscious is going to say, mm, something was wrong. They noticed that there was a difference and they changed the rule. Okay. So the idea of interlanguage is in between uh, the actual rules of that particular language and where they're at. It's kind of an in-between state. They're in the process of building the proper rules, but they haven't got there. They haven't gotten there yet. And so those rules are changing as they go on. And it's a dynamic process. Uh, and you can see students uh, as these rules change, as these things become noticeable to them and they make those, they make those changes. Another principle we need to look at, and we should look more in the interlanguage, and probably we'll be doing that in, in a second language acquisition series that I'll be building uh, very soon. Last point here with regard to linguistic principles is communicative competence. As with uh, we spoke earlier, the communicative competence is really what we are trying to get to with regard to language use. We want people to be able to be accurate and fluent and understand uh, how to use uh, the grammar properly and understand and develop a very large vocabulary and pronunciation skill so that they can be competent in all the areas that language is. Um, and so here's a list of things that we should recognize as, as far as the communicative competence principles. One is that uh, we want to use grammar rules or drilling only as part of the curriculum. Um, and I use it as a very small part. Uh, I prefer, uh, I mean, it's okay to do some of that, but I prefer trying to give them a reading or a task that has embedded within it grammar that they don't necessarily know yet so that they can come to this and say, hey, what is this? And then they can focus on the form and then they move on and, and finish whatever task that they're doing. Um, Regardless, when using grammatical uh, rules or teaching grammar to students, make sure that it's only part of what's going on, okay? Because there's a, many other aspects that you want students to be able to, to use when they're, when they're using a language. Uh, there are some pr pragmatic aspects that are subtle, and you as a language teacher should teach that fact. There are some things that are more difficult to teach because they are, again, they're subtle. And you as a student or you as a teacher may all of a sudden notice, hey, you know, uh, they're not using it in that proper way. And, and then you need to try to explain that to them. But you should let your students know this, right? Let them know that there are going to be little nuanced things that are going on that, that aren't going to be in textbooks that uh, you may not have anticipated. Uh, and so that, again, it's more dynamic. Recognize also point number three here that pronunciation is very important. Have any of you ever had a language teacher or biology teacher or a computer teacher who was a foreigner and their pronunciation was atrocious and it was difficult for you to understand what was going on? Not that it was a bad teacher per se, but they had their pronunciation impaired um, the classroom. You, as a language teacher, don't want to see that happen. You need to recognize that there is a sociological impact to students, to people who are speaking language and don't have a sufficient pronunciation to be able to communicate well. There is a stigma with some sounds, not all. Um, so having a little bit of an accent uh, isn't necessarily bad, but if it's going to impede meaningful communication, it's going to be a problem. So it's important as far as the ability to communicate, but it's also important because people are going to look down on you because of your accent, depending on how severe your pronunciation problems are. So you as a language teacher you want to try to eliminate the law as, as many as you can, obviously work with the easier ones or the more disruptive ones first, but you'll still want to do that. Don't be a hypercorrector. <clears throat> My, my uh, recommendation for you here is to notice your students. Notice when you're overcorrecting them. Notice when you're, the, you're kind of smashing their motivation. 
Okay, you want to correct them. You want to help them to do the right thing. Okay, we're going to talk about correcting methods later on, but don't overdo it. Watch your students. Notice when you're killing motivation. Notice when you're hurting their their uh, personality in such a way that they don't they're gonna not gonna want to learn, and it can happen. Don't be a hyper corrector. Communication uh, is more important than complete accuracy. All right. Try to make techniques as authentic as possible. Okay, you're trying to create uh, activities that are real life that students can be can use right away. They're practical. They're pragmatic. Um, some so there's a lot of materials that are out there that can be very useful for you. Obviously, you can make materials. When you try to use them or try to make them, make sure they're all as authentic as possible. Lastly, encourage students to be independent learners. Encourage autonomy. Um, because an independent learner who has control over his learning is going to be more motivated. Uh, obviously, you want to be there. You want to be that facilitator, one who can help them out as they go along. Okay? Last thing I want to show you here are some hours of study. This is by Omaggio and her textbook, uh, Teaching Language in Context. It is a fabulous book. Uh, one that I would recommend you acquire, however, it is quite expensive. Um, toward, well, actually, toward the beginning of the book, Almagio describes uh, the military's uh, language, foreign language uh, service, and the number of hours that um, they discovered regarding um, language learners. And they broke everything down into four groups and to find out, uh, uh, to describe, I'm sorry, to describe how many hours uh, it does take for a typical language user to learn a language. So, for example, in this group one language, people who are learning English, if you speak Afrikaans or Danish, Dutch, French, any of these languages, it's going to be easier for you to learn English. This group one is the, is the group that's going to have the least amount of struggle in learning a language. Look here. In order to get to a level one, it takes 240 hours. In order to get to a level, uh, to a, an, an intermediate or a superior level, right, this one down here, takes about 720 hours, okay? Now, bear in mind, a typical uh, semester uh, at a school is uh, for if, it, if they're taking one class, it's 15 hours plus two hours outside. That's um, that's 45 hours. They're taking two classes. That's 90 hours. They're taking uh, three classes. That's 1,200 hours. Uh, uh, two classes. That's 120 hours, right? 120. So in two some in one year, someone at this level could probably get to a one a one plus takes a much longer to get to a level three, but this is the easy group. Look at group two, Bulgarian, Farsi, German, Hindi, in order to get to a level three, right? In order to get to a level three, it's now 1,300 hours, not 700 hours. It's double, right? And if you speak uh, Nepali or Bengali or Czech or Finnish or Hebrew, in order to get to a level three, now it's up to, it's again, it's up to 1,300 hours. You said somewhat similar here, but it's, again, that's only for superior level. For uh, average learners, are going to get to 1,300 hours, going to be a little more difficult. The last group, Arabic, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, in order to get to a level 2 or a level 3 is 2,400 hours, 2,500 hours. And so the amount of time for upper level students is amazingly uh, more difficult for, for these harder languages. When we go back and we talk about uh, language ego or the impact of, I'm sorry, the impact of uh, the first language, we should recognize that students that are down here in these more difficult levels, they're going to have much more of a problem acquiring language at the speed that the early, the easier students are. So that language <clears throat> does have an impact. And, uh, of course, if we're going to be studying language, we as language studiers need to know, oh, I'm a English, native English speaker. If I'm going to learn, you know, if I want to learn German or I want to learn, uh, you know, Thai, the amount of time that's going to take me is going to be much more than the amount of time if I'm going to be learning one of these easier languages. Easier from an English perspective, right, from an English perspective. Bear in mind, if you're a Chinese and you're learning Korean, it's going to be a lot easier because the similarities are there, right? It's not going to take them as many hours. It's going to take them more hours to learn English, but not to learn, you know, Arabic or Japanese or whatever. All right, and so this is the teaching by principles and the variety of cognitive and socio-affective and cultural principles that are involved. I do hope uh, you uh, understood everything here. If you do have any questions, you can obviously get a hold of me. <clears throat> and uh, please get ready to start working on the next chapter.